Good morning. I love how the light dimming down um, is the, the cue to get into our seats and to get ready uh, for our worship service. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to be with you this Lord's Day. And I'd like to welcome especially any visitors that we might have with us today, either in person or online. We are very glad that you're here. I also want to say thank you to all of those who organized especially, but also participated in the barbecue yesterday. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm looking forward to many more of those kinds of things. I understand that there are already scheduled for the rest of this year more of them on the calendar. So I'm looking forward to that and hope that you might join us to those as well. I, I want to say a quick note about Tim and Julie getting married on Saturday, and I, I suspect, they haven't asked for this, but I suspect they might covet your prayers uh, for that. <laughs> They're saying yes. Okay, that's a good idea. Uh, and then lastly, announcement-wise, we have a new Sunday school starting next Sunday. Uh, it's just a continuation of the Sunday school that's been meeting in my, my office, uh, except that it has a new topic. So instead of doing faith and doubt, we are now going to take a slow walk through the Westminster Confession of Faith for three months, and then there'll be a new topic, which I think I have chosen, but I'll announce that later. Um, and so if, if you're already joining us for Sunday School, then great. If you're excited about that topic, great. If you're somebody who doesn't come to Sunday School yet, let me remind you, these two classes that we have, both Mark's that meets in the library and mine now on the Westminster Confession with John Nernis, uh, are great opportunities for you, and now is as good a time as any to jump in and to be part of our Sunday school, which are already well attended, relatively speaking, but there's empty chairs in both rooms, and so there's room for more. We would love to have those be filled. And now let us hear God's word as we are called by Him to worship. From Psalm 34, we hear, Come praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your house. Your word tells us that you're everywhere, but there is something special where your people are gathered in your name, to offer back to you that which you are due based on your glory. You are worthy of our praise, and so we ask that you would cause us to give it to you now. Stir up whatever needs stirred in our hearts, whether that leads, up to lift up, leads us to lift up our hands, um, that's, that's your business. This is a Presbyterian church after all. But, Lord, you are worthy for lifting of hands and stirring of hearts and singing excitedly the words of Scripture back to you because you are glorious. Would our worship be consistent with that? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please stand.
Our scripture reading, our additional scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. We always try, at least I do, to, uh, and I think Dan does as well, to couple an Old Testament sermon with a New Testament reading and vice versa. And so that is partly the design of this scripture for today. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 18, truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the door If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father." As we consider the Good Shepherd and we think about him just a little bit, we might realize that we, in the analogy, are the sheep. And what do the sheep do but wander away from the flock and from the shepherd? And so, if you would join with me in silent confession as we confess to him how we have wandered from him, and then I will lead us in a corporate confession.
Good shepherd, we have wandered from you so often and so far. Again and again, we've broken your law and we've taken your grace for granted. You have proven yourself again and again to be trustworthy, powerful, wise, and, and loving in the most profound way, sacrificially loving. Yet we have disregarded your care by venturing out on our own or by trusting in some sort of bad shepherd. Lord, have mercy. Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear our voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of our pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. Our soul waits, and in his word we hope. Our soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. And now, hear this good news, this word from what I just read, that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Friends, by the sacrifice of Christ, and if you are united to him by faith, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Perhaps the, one of the biggest challenges I believe I have personally, and by extension, I think the whole Christian church, especially here in the United States, in the Western world, is the idea of self-sufficiency. It is so easy for me to be self-sufficient. It's so easy for me to rely on my own abilities, my um, circumstances, the resources that are available to me. It's so easy to become complacent and to relegate God to a place of emergency. I think for me, I need to hear. Like Isaiah said, I'm undone when he saw the holiness of God. And despite my good circumstances, I need to hear that Jesus is sufficient, that my hope is not in the things I can see, the things that I have, my comfort, my security, financial security. But it is in Jesus Christ, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So when those adverse circumstances come, my hope is not washed out from and under me like the sand on the beach. But I can stand firm on the rock that is in Jesus Christ. The rock, the second song we're doing is um, Rock of Ages. The rock in which God puts me to hide me, my security. My hope, please stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace, 
in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, for blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sun. We're going to sing this chorus one more time, and I want you to sing out really loud because I'm not going to play, okay? On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sun. All other ground is sinking You may be seated. I'd like to ask the ushers and deacons to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings.
Please bow your heads with me as we continue in our worship, coming before the Lord in prayer. Father, here we are in great need. Maybe not physical need, maybe not material need, but Lord, how we need you, how we need you in our lives, in our souls, in our spiritual selves. Father, how we need to learn your love and compassion, how we need to learn your forgiveness, how we need you to walk with us day by day. Your ways are not our ways, Lord, but teach us your ways. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the body of Christ, which you've left for encouragement, for building up, for working together to spread your glorious gospel. Lord, help, find us faithful in what you've given us to do. And Father, through your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give us a burning desire to reach those who have not who don't know you. Father, we pray for this church and her ministries. Lord, we ask that you would bless the missionaries that we support and the work that they do. We ask, Father, that you would bless the session and the deacons and our pastors, that they would be faithful in their service to you. We pray, Father, for our nation. And, Father, we look around and we see the things that are not compatible with what you've shown us your ways are. Lord, it's always been like that. We are, you are at enmity with the world. Help us, Father, to know how to navigate that space between not conforming and being a light of love to those who don't know you. Father, we pray for the upcoming election, how contentious it always is. And Lord, we always say this is the most contentious or this is the worst. And this is, this is the, uh, the, the, the possibly um, the uh, most dangerous election we've ever had. But Lord, we know through your word that you raise up leaders. And Father, I pray that you would give us confidence, not in men, but in you, that you will bring about what you want to accomplish. Father, I pray for those sick among us, that you would heal. Thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. I, I pray for those who are suffering uh, a broken heart or a broken spirit that you would comfort. And Father, I pray also that you would open up our hearts to hear your word, that it would not be just uh, words of a man, but that your Holy Spirit would, would speak and that those words would penetrate not only our ears and our minds, but our hearts, so that we could be changed more and more into the one who died and gave his life for us. And we pray together as Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, children, I would love for you to join me up front. I have something I'd like to talk to you about.
Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Where do we start again? I'm kind of forgetting. The Bible. Oh, yeah, the Bible. Okay. I'm going to read a little part of the Bible, and then we're going to talk about it, okay? So God's Word says that God is our protection and our strength, and He's always ready to help when we need Him. So let's not be afraid. Have you ever been scared? All of you should nod. Um, what are some things that are scary? When I got chased by a cow. Chased by a cow. That is scary, yes. <laughs> yes. Who else? Anyone else want to share what, what scares you? Ghosts. Ghosts. Those are scary, yeah. Do you believe that I'm scared of anything? Yeah? All right, well, let me start with when I was your age. You want to know what I was scared of when I was your age? I was scared of getting lost, especially like in a store when I was with my mom, and I was afraid that she was going to go down another aisle and I wouldn't be able to find her, even though I one time hid in the middle of a clothes rack and she couldn't find me. I think she was the one that was scared that day. I was also scared of heights, and I still am today. Um, I'm also scared of the dark when I was your age. And I also watched some scary movies which made these fears a whole lot worse. And I want to say to you and to your parents right now, that's not a very good idea. Let's not give ourselves more things to be scared of, right? It was a big mistake. All right, so is it okay to be afraid? No. No? Why not? Is it okay? Yeah, you think so? No. Is it normal to be scared? Yeah. It is normal? Especially if you got a big cow chasing you down, right? That's a healthy fear. Yeah. Um, what should we do when we get scared? Go to sleep. Go to sleep? Yeah. Well, that's especially if we're scared at nighttime, right? But isn't it hard to fall asleep sometimes when we're scared? If we're scared in the middle of the night, what do we tend to do? Go to bed with my parents. Yeah, go visit mom and dad, right? They're safe. And they help remind us that there's nothing to be scared of, right? Or they tell us it's going to be okay because I'm with you. What will make us feel safe? Turning the lights on so we can see everything, right? Mom and dad, because they're going to protect us if something bad happens. What does God tell us when we get scared? Do you know what the Bible says about when we get scared? Because we do. Jesus. He tells us about Jesus. Well, he, that's true. He also says, do not fear. Do not fear. He doesn't tell us that because he thinks being scared is bad. He tells us that because he knows we're going to get scared, and he wants us to feel comfortable do you want to know what it says after do not fear in the Bible? There's a because. Do not fear because I am with you. That's almost always what it says. We can be not afraid anymore because God is with us. So we're never actually alone in the dark or in the ring with a cow or a bull or anything of that sort. And also, we can never be lost from God because He is everywhere we go. Even in the clothes rack when I was hiding from my mom, He was there with me. The thing is, though, that we forget. We forget He's with us. And so that's what makes us scared. And that's why it's so good for us to have reminders. Reminders from the Bible, reminders from our parents, some reminders that God is with us because that makes all the difference in the world. We also do well to pray. When we get scared, the best thing to do is to pray. Should we do that now? Heavenly Father, we do get scared, and we don't have to lie about that because it's natural, but it's also something that you want to help us with. 
And you tell us that you being with us all the time is the best reason not to be scared because like a good mom and dad, you're going to protect us from anything that you don't want us to face. And you're going to go with us through anything hard that we do face. So thank you for being with us all the time, Lord. Let that not just be something that we know about, but that we feel in our hearts. You're always with us. And thank you for Jesus who's made that happen. In his name we pray, amen. Thanks, boys and girls. Well, if you would, please open your Bibles with me to the 121st Psalm. That's where we're going to camp out this morning, a bit of a pause in our series in 2 Timothy. Psalm 121. I'll read it and pray, and then we'll talk about what the Lord has revealed to me this week. A song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is beautiful and glorious, and it reveals things about you, and it comforts us. Thank you for the truth that it reveals that you are our protector, our guardian, our shepherd, always with us, ever vigilant, ever loving, sacrificial. You are always there for us, providing everything we need. Lord, would you reveal to us how that is true in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, have any of you ever experienced, I guess what I'll call travel anxiety? Have you ever been worried about a trip that you are about to take, either a short one, like to the grocery store in the middle of a snowstorm, or on a long one, say, to the other side of the planet and perhaps to a third world country? Have you ever been scared? facing unknowns, maybe having the situation where your safety is not entirely in your hands, in areas unfamiliar to us like overseas or downtown. Who knows what happens downtown or actually in Charlotte, we call it uptown, right? Or in the middle of nowhere, we may fear the unknown, won't we? On airplanes, Anytime we go on an airplane, we place our hands in somebody else's life unless you happen to be the pilot. And if you are, more power to you. But most of the time, we, we trust that they're going to do the job. They're going to get us to where we need to go. And sometimes there's turbulence along the way, and that's scary. It raises the anxiety level. In our own cars, we may travel on snowy or very wet roads and that requires us having a very high alert level, two hands on the wheel, making sure that I'm not going to let go because if I have to swerve, I need to make sure I do it right. It requires also a lot of good driving instincts and skills to navigate safely. In Scripture, God's people know that feeling as well. Of course, not about airplanes and cars, but about travel and just about navigating the perils of life. This psalm is one of 15 that are categorized as songs of ascent. In the superscript of this one, it says that those little small caps writings at the top of the psalm, it says, a song of ascents. That's a category of Scripture from Psalms 120 through 134 
that the people of Israel would sing in a pilgrimage on their journey, specifically, most often, to Jerusalem so that they could participate in the festivals and the religious gatherings, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Booths, et cetera, et cetera. There were times of the year when people from all over the place, not just from Judah, but from all over Israel and even from the out, out of the bounds from Israel, would come and participate in these religious gatherings. And on the journey, they would sing these psalms. They probably sang others as well, but these, this was the design of these songs. This was their purpose, to encourage and to strengthen these pilgrims in their travels. And Jerusalem was the cultural and religious center of Israel. So they were preparing themselves for something very important, but they faced a dangerous journey along the way. So they sang these songs over and over from generation to generation to give them much needed reminders. They were seeking safety and comfort as they felt vulnerable while they traveled. Where would they find that comfort? Who will protect them? Where will their help come from? This song, Psalm 121, and others like it reminded them and still reminds us today that through the uncertainties and perils of life, our help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Before we can consider investing in any potential help, whether good or bad, we've got to ask an important question. What's the danger? What's the risk? What are we facing here? I'm going to categorize it in two categories, two main types, the first being physical danger. This is what we see in first one. Why is the psalmist lifting up his eyes to the hills? What's the big danger? Did you even realize when I read that 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 is referring to danger? So the hills, when they were traveling to Jerusalem, especially on near approach to Jerusalem, it's a hilly country. And in those hills lied the danger. And so brigands and marauders and thieves would hide in the hills ready to ambush any travelers on their way to Jerusalem. You could imagine bad guys would capitalize on this situation, knowing when the feasts were, knowing when the travelers would come, knowing that they'd be probably bringing things to offer or to prepare in these feasts or their money. This is a great opportunity to steal and to do harm. So the danger lied in the hills because the hills is where the thieves concealed themselves. It was a formidable threat to those in a vulnerable state. These people were away from their comforts of home. The trips that they were taking would at least take days, if not weeks, if they're coming from outside Israel. Again, they didn't have planes and trains and automobiles. They got to walk. And if they're lucky, they rode on a camel or a donkey or maybe a horse. This would take a long time out in the open, out in the wilderness, navigating not well-established and not well-policed roads like we might have come to expect. And then they'd go to sleep at night with questionable, at best, security, pitching a tent on the side of the road, maybe trying to get a little bit off the road because the road, again, where the brigands are probably going to hang out. And so at night and during the day, when they're moving and stationary, they're feeling at risk. And then there's the threats of nature. There's the heat. It gets really uncomfortable. You could get dehydrated. You could get burned. There's the cold. We think of the Middle East as a hot area, but at night, it got really cold there. And the contrast between the two would have been incredibly uncomfortable. There is weather to contend with scary storms, unpredictable events. There's animals. Not just humans would pose a threat, but animals. And of course, there's always the risk of some sort of accident, falling into a ditch, breaking in bone, something like that, that would have been far more devastating in their time than even for us today. And especially the risk from other humans would have been huge. The way was dangerous for these annual travelers, and they knew it. At this point, I want to remind us that this is a psalm. 
one of the 150 psalms, the songbook of God's people. And they were inspired and meant to be a spiritual guide for God's people, not just then, but also today. They're for us. They're the song not just for travelers from wherever to Jerusalem, but for us as we travel through life. Can we relate? Do we ever face physical danger? Of course, travel still carries a risk. It's not 100% certain when you get in your car that you'll make it home. It's not 100% certain that the plane will travel from point A to point B successfully. We know what happens. We've seen the news. Of course, like then and still today, there's also criminal activity. We might think about that more when we head into Uptown, for instance. There's more likely to be danger there. And as is then and still today, there's weather events. There's tornadoes and maybe around here, more likely hurricanes and things like that. And if none of those worry you at all, how about health concerns? Everyone faces those, right? I believe this psalm applies to that as well. As a father, I probably think more often about not my own safety, but the safety and protection of my kids. That's what dominates my mind. And as a parent, I've considered that I have a choice to make. One of two methods, like big picture methods of parenting. The first would be to be a helicopter. Are you all familiar with that term, helicopter parent? hovering over the kids to make sure that they're doing nothing that might cause them any degree of harm, protecting them every step of the way from any threat that might come from here or there or here, helicoptering all the time, hovering over our kids. The opposite would be to allow for any and all risks to take place. Probably, as with most things, the best balance is somewhere in the middle. Watch for the serious threats, but let them explore, let them adventure, let them learn how to navigate risks and danger themselves. We all have that choice to make, not just about our kids, but about ourselves as well. We have this nasty little inclination to create a bubble, let's call it, a bubble that gives us a false sense of security, or we can deal with it in another way, a healthier way this point, I want to remind us that our human bodies are fragile. Physical danger really does exist, and they threaten us. Life can end in an instant, even when you don't expect it. A good friend of mine when I was in college died when I was 20 years old, and he was 19. And that opened my eyes, to say the least. I was a kid who used to, like, jump off my garage at my grandparents' house thinking I was invincible, and all of a sudden, a friend of mine very close to me died like within days. It's shocking. It's eye-opening to know that that could happen, and it could happen to me. Will I be ready for that day when it comes? Will you be ready for that day when it comes? Do you know what happens when you die? Just recently, we had a Sunday school class that talked about this, I think there's a lot of misconceptions in the church about this, so I want to provide a very brief, high-level view of what happens when we die. First of all, the question, really the only question that matters is, are we united to Christ or are we not? If you don't know anything else but the answer to that question, and that the answer is yes, then you'll be fine. Because if yes, then you're headed most immediately to what Jesus called paradise. If no, then you are headed immediately to what Scripture most often calls hell or Hades. Either way, whether in paradise or in hell, you are awaiting the the return of Jesus and the final judgment, at which point everyone will be judged based on what they did in this life, and believers will say, I claim Christ and therefore go to what is called the new heavens and the new earth. That's the final state, not heaven, but the new heavens and the new earth with resurrected bodies. With all that in mind, 
the much more significant danger, much more significant than physical danger, is spiritual danger. This is the sort of danger that we see in verses 6 to 7. This is the sort of danger that can deeply and finally hurt us. In the psalm, verse 6 is a bit of a puzzle. It talks about the sun there. The sun may literally burn or dehydrate a traveler during the day in such an arid environment, and the night might be unbearably cold in comparison, but I don't think that's the psalmist's big issue. I don't think that's what he's talking about there necessarily. I think his bigger concern is with the constancy of danger. It's always present. There's no time or place that you can go to where the danger isn't real. Day and night, the danger threatens. The form of the greatest danger becomes clear in verse 7. We are vulnerable to all sorts of evil, both from out there in the world, in our culture, to in here, within ourselves. We're vulnerable to this danger. From outside, we have spiritual influences like the bad kind of spiritual influences, the, the tug to other religions, the tug to atheism, the tug away from the Lord. And we have cultural influences which say, have your best life now, live it up, you deserve this. We see it on billboards and TV commercials and everything. We have all those influences which may lead us astray. And then there's the danger from within which is far scarier because we have these whispers of unbelief and the enticements of sin which threaten to do damage to our souls. Someone I know is going through a very difficult time right now. This someone is alienated from his oldest child. He's got a serious degree of discord in his marriage, and he was recently fired for being dishonest at his job, and he is still today unemployed for about a month. Digging deeper into this man's life, what we find is an ongoing struggle with pornography. I have no idea how many of you here struggle with this. My heart wants to say none, knowing most of you. I want that to be true, but research and statistics tell me that's very unlikely. Technology has made it available to unprecedented degrees and it allows people to avoid the stigma of shame that used to go with it. And it destroys. It destroys souls. And it destroys marriages. Enough about that. And on to another great danger. And that is for us to think that there is no danger at all. I'm fine. I've got this. As Mike said, we, we feel like we are self-sufficient. We can navigate this life on our own. We don't need any help. That's dangerous. You can't. And if you think you can, you've got a rude awakening coming to you. The greatest risks come when we let our guard down or when we improperly answer the psalmist's question, where does my help come from? Who or what can help me navigate this pilgrimage of life? And what kind of help do I need? So often we're inclined to think, I can help myself. I can do it. Pull up the bootstraps. I've got this. I'll take care of it. Or that money that I've saved up, that money that I earned, that'll fix it. And if I can just get more of it, then I'll be set. Or perhaps I put my trust in a parent or for us older people, a therapist. Or maybe some political figure is going to fix it. If the election goes right, they'll take care of it and there won't be any more danger. We'll be all set. The psalm makes it quite clear that the only truly effective source of help in our lives comes from the Lord either directly or indirectly, it comes from the Lord through some means which He provides. The Lord is our helper, and in several key ways that the psalm reveals to us. First, He's a vigilant helper. It says here that He won't let your foot be moved. 
When I think about this, I think about being at the beach. You ever stand in the surf on the beach? There's a big wave that comes and you might turn sideways to brace for it and get down when you bend your knees because if you're standing straight up and you're about two, three feet in and the surf is a healthy size, that is at the ocean, not at a lake. At the ocean, it'll knock you over, won't it? The farther in you go, the more likely it is. You've got to brace. You've got to get ready. Maybe even, as I try to do, dig my feet into the sand to get a good, solid foundation. And even then, big one comes, and I'm swimming underwater. The Lord is our sure footing. And only with Him as our foundation will we, will we be ready when that big wave comes. Also, it says that this, this helper of ours will neither slumber nor sleep. For this, I'm reminded of those disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night which Jesus was betrayed. They were decidedly not vigilant. Their human limitations, the fact that they were tired, overcame them in the middle of the night, and also their own sinfulness, their own selfishness, their own self-centeredness overcame them. What did Jesus tell them to do exactly? Do you remember? He told them to pray, right? And what for? What did he pray for? That they might not enter into temptation. Again, their great danger wasn't so much physical with a mob of people carrying clubs and swords and torches and who knows what ready to arrest their Savior. Their great danger was spiritual, that they might fall into temptation. Christian, take comfort in knowing that our helper is not merely human. He's not subject to our shortcomings. He is, in fact, God. And he won't be taken by surprise or caught off guard or let you down or let you fall or any of that. That also makes him a very capable helper. We see this in verse 2. Many of the potential helpers that we might look to in alternative to Jesus might be willing to help us like a good parent might but not able to provide what we need, not truly, not ultimately. The Lord, though, He doesn't have just good intentions, but He also has the ability to carry out whatever His plans are. He has the ability to follow through. He has the ability to deliver. Let me say that more strongly. If He intends or wills to provide us with any degree of help, he will do it, most definitely. He cannot be stopped. He may not and often will not provide the help that we want, though. Let's make sure we make a difference, make sure we understand that distinction. He won't provide the help we want necessarily, but he will provide the help that he in his infinite wisdom knows that we need. And know that he will always prioritize our spiritual well-being over anything else. But God is not handcuffed by any of those limitations. And along those lines, he is also a very present helper, as we see in verse 5. He's available and he's accessible. He's everywhere, all the time, in the dark, in the heights, on a roller coaster, wherever. He's there. We have a limited perspective, a limited ability, limited resources, limited knowledge, limited wisdom, and our great helper lacks none of those things. Psalm 46 says he is a very present help in trouble. He's not just there as a spectator or a bystander. He's not just watching, but he is your very active guardian, protecting And I'd like to note that he doesn't promise to prevent trouble, but to be there with you through it and to protect you and shepherd you while you face it. I think of Superman. He was always facing a very similar dilemma, Superman was. 
He had all these powers. He could fly. He had laser beam sight. He could go up into space and survive somehow. But he couldn't be in two places at once. And he was often faced with saving a woman, Lois Lane, I think was her name, or saving the rest of humanity, right? He had to pick. It was either she's going to die or they're going to die. He couldn't be in two places at once. The theological fact, though, is that God is everywhere and he can do an infinite amount of things at the same time because he is an infinite being. So he can take care of your cares and your cares and your cares and your cares and protect you and protect you and protect me all at the same time and not face any trouble in doing so. My pastoral reminder to you is that he is with you everywhere you go all the time, personally. That hits a little harder, doesn't it? He's with you. To sum up the Lord's protection, we might call him a good shepherd. The Psalms are full of imagery, and what this one is trying to convey is that like a shepherd, God oversees all the comings and goings of his sheep. He's aware of every step they take. From the moment they leave the sheep gate, they go through the gates and they start their wandering, whether the good kind or the bad kind of wandering, he goes with them every step of the way until they come back to the sheepfold and then they require the protection of the sheep at night because they can't keep watch themselves. That is what the Lord does for his people. Surely you'll recognize this from Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff are illustrative of God's protective and corrective staff, wielded by the good shepherd who is always looking after his sheep to correct them from sin, to bring them back from wandering, to keep them safe in the flock. God is providing this level of protection. Every second of every day, nothing happens to us without his willingness, and whatever does happen to us will certainly be for our spiritual good. Guaranteed. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he, pre- he knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And listen to how that protection continues. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. He sees it through from beginning to end. All of our comings and goings from conception to the day we die and to finally when he comes back to make all things new, he is watching over us through every step of the way. And friends, the most important thing that the good shepherd does for us is that he laid down his life for the sheep. This he did for you and for me at the cross And with his blood, he eliminated our great spiritual danger, the greatest danger we could ever face. He took care of it. I want to offer a slight bit of a warning. His help is for his people. John 10 says, his sheep hear his voice. Not everyone, his sheep hear his voice. The psalm says that he keeps Israel, that is, God's people. He keeps God's people safe. And so without faith and trust in the good shepherd, you remain closed off to his protection, either by going it alone or by trusting in something or someone that cannot deliver you and cannot protect you like only he can. As y'all have gathered or are gathering, I'm a sci-fi fan. And I like thrillers. And in so many of them, characters often have a critical decision to make at some point. They come face to face with some danger and they typically make one of three choices. The first of those is they set off on their own. They run away from the group on their own and you know what's going to happen to them, right? They're in extreme danger, let's say. 
Or they might follow the wrong leader, the leader that's going to lead them to a path of destruction, and you know it's going to happen to them. We can all tell. You can see it. You can see the writing on the wall in every one of these shows. Or they can trust in a capable leader, which doesn't guarantee anything because not every movie has a happy ending, but most do, don't they? And we know that if they follow this capable leader, they've got the best chance at making it. There are, in my estimation, two big applications for this song. First of all, it is to learn and sing some songs or whatever their equivalent is in your life that will help you navigate the difficulties of life. Literally singing the Psalms are a good idea or memorizing other parts of Scripture, getting it on the tip of your tongue so that when you face the danger that God brings about, the very word that he's provided will be the balm that you need to get through it or the direction that you need to be led through it. Get the psalms, get the songs, whatever form they come in, into your heart. And secondly, I think this psalm calls us to pray. Pray to the one that we know can help. Pray to the one who's got it all in his hands, all under control, including our own fears and anxieties and concerns. All of it is in his good and sovereign care. When we pray, we acknowledge that we're dependent. When we pray, we say, I want something that I can't provide for myself, and it is you, Lord, that I know can provide it. We admit that we are dependent when we pray, and it is good for us to feel dependent on the guardianship of the Lord and for us to look to Him in faith and provide it. So let's trust in our perfectly capable and willing helper and protector. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we're honest and when we look at our lives properly, we are fully aware that we are incapable of providing for ourselves and protecting ourselves. Things happen in our life that are outside of our control. Despite our best efforts of controlling them, we fail because we're not you. We don't have that kind of power or wisdom or knowledge. But we know a guy that does. It's our Lord Jesus. Lord, would you help us to entrust our lives into your care expecting that the good shepherd will take care of his sheep. In his glorious name we pray, amen. It's not every Sunday that we get to apply what has been suggested for us in the sermon. But today we are, because this last uh, hymn is Psalm 121. It is from the Psalter, and for those who don't know what the Psalter is, it is the Psalms put into a singable arrangement. So before, a little bit of history, if you look in, uh, in, in your hymn books, um, you won't see much written before the mid-19th century. And it was always curious to me, what, what did these people sing before then? Well, they were singing the Psalter, the Psalms. So we're going to finish this morning with Psalm 121. It will be a very familiar tune. It's a joyful, joyful, we adore thee. That's the tune. And this fits uh, very well into it. So please stand. To the hills I lift my eyes. When shall help for me arise? From the Lord shall come my aid, who the heaven and earth has made. He will guide through dangers all. He will suffer thee to fall. He who safe his people keeps, slumbers not and never sleeps. My protector is the Lord, shade for thee he will afford. Neither sun nor moon shall smite.
God shall guard by day and night. He will keep thy soul, soul. It was a pleasure to worship our Lord with you, and now please go with these words. The grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and his protection be with you today and always. Amen.